Bob Heath, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. I'm so excited to learn from you tonight. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for, uh, <clears throat> for inviting me to do this. This is the first webinar I've ever done, and I'm really looking forward to it. I always like doing new things, even if they're in the dead of winter. Um, clearly, my virtual background wasn't taken today. <laughs> wasn't today just a wonderful day? Um, you know, we can all think that spring is far be is close at hand. And so here we are. It's winter. So where are the bees? Often out of sight and out of mind. And we just uh, think, well, the bees will be there. They've always been there. But what can we do? Or what, what do we do to hinder the bees during the winter? And what can we do to help the bees? That's the whole question that I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, let's see, how are we going to do this? Oh, there we go. So uh, we all like to have nice gardens. Uh, we like to have flowers and vegetables in our gardens. Uh, and uh, we know that when we have gardens, <clears throat> well, we certainly know we've got to water them, we've got to feed them, we've got to weed them. But one thing we never really think of is what about being? But what about the bees? And uh, we often hear how habitat is uh, important. In fact, one of the reasons uh, both honeybees and native bees are having some uh, population declines now is because of habitat loss. <clears throat> also for other reasons, but largely habitat loss. And so we, when we think of, well, let's put in habitat, we think of something like this. Well, let's put in a row of flowers to help uh, bring in bees to pollinate our uh, flowers and crops. But most bees really don't fly very far. We think of honeybees as flying three miles. And of course, bumblebees and uh, carpenter bees can fly uh, several miles to find their uh, floral resources. But most bees don't. Most bees stay pretty close to their nest, uh, maybe flying as much as 300 feet, but that's about it. So when we say we want to provide habitat for bees, we also have to think in terms of providing habitat so that they can overwinter. And bees, the reason we focus on bees is they're not the only pollinator, but they are certainly the most important pollinator. Uh, in fact, many flowers can be pollinated only by bees. Uh, and of those, some can be pollinated only by certain bees. As I said, well, some bees fly, can fly up to three miles, your larger bees like honeybees and bumblebees. Uh, most stay pretty close to home. And but we need bees of all sorts. So we need to make sure that they'll be there. Of course, the pun is intended for those of you who know me. Uh, of course, uh, we want to make sure that the bee will be there when we need them and we need them really all the time often more than we even think that we do. But let's start with a bee that we all know, or at least think we know, uh, the honeybee. And uh, the honeybee is a social bee. That means that uh, it develops a, qual a colony with a single queen who's in charge of laying the eggs. Um, and so it's a perennial life cycle. Uh, that is to say, the queen will live up to four years, three or four years. And uh, when she goes, uh, there will be other, uh, there are ways of requeening. And, and all. another thing that we often don't think about is that the honeybee is domesticated. It's one of the most domesticated uh, agricultural animals that we have. What that means is, Honeybees depend on humans. Uh, and what humans do helps them or can hinder them. Uh, the bees uh, live in hives. Uh, there's no such thing as a 
wild honeybee, uh, those that may be living in uh, trees or cavities uh, are feral, but they're not, uh, they're not wild. To, uh, the honeybee originated in uh, Tajikistan and then radiated out from there. So if you wanted to find wild honeybees, uh, you'd have to go to uh, over to Asia to find wild honeybees. What's nice about them is that they're a generalist pollinator. That means that they can pollinate a lot of flowers that uh, occur throughout the season. So they can pollinate early, some uh, a lot of early season flowers as well as uh, mid season and late season flowers. Now the queen, as I said, lives up to four years uh, and she lays uh, eggs in the brood. And then if she fertilizes those eggs, those will turn into females and those will be the female workers. If she doesn't fertilize the egg, then those become the male drones. And remember the purpose for a male, and this is for almost all of these, the only purpose for a male is to have sex with a female. After that, uh, they generally die. And I, and I don't even know if they die happy or just, just die. But uh, in the winter, uh, bees overwinter as a colony of adults. And uh, this is unusual. Only truly social bees do this. And there are very relatively few, actually very few, uh, bees that uh, will overwinter as a colony of adults. Uh, and they do this by the workers clustering around the queen and they survive on the stored honey that has been provided there through the season. So this is, uh, this is a diagram of the hives. Uh, at the base, we have two brood boxes, which is where the uh, honeybees live. And uh, honeybees in particular like to live on the ground floor and they like to store honey up in the attic. And so uh, people who keep honeybees as my wife Beth and I do, we, we keep it for the honey. And a lot of people keep honeybees for the honey and those are uh, then stored in these upper boxes which are called supers, meaning they're in addition to the regular hive. The, bee, the colonies will range from 20,000 to 50,000 individuals. Uh, some have been recorded as a little bit more than that, but that's generally it. And that's a pretty good sized colony. Uh, the uh, worker bees then go out and gather nectar and pollen uh, from April through October. Uh, they convert the nectar to honey. And uh, if you're interested in keeping honeybees for the honey, they're the only species, you don't have any choice in that, they're the only species of bee that you can keep in North America. There are worldwide, there are uh, six other species, uh, but here in North America, the only uh, bee that makes excessive amounts of honey is the honeybee. And the bees use the honey as a source of carbohydrates uh, they use the pollen as a protein source, which is necessary for when the bees are growing. And then often honeybees need to have sources of water from the field. And so if you're keeping honeybees, you want to make sure that they have some source of uh, water available. <clears throat> One of the important things about honeybees is that they're commercially useful. Uh, uh, for example, in California, the uh, California almond groves are really highly dependent on the presence of honeybees that are trucked in uh, literally by the truckload uh, for pollination purposes. And so honeybees are important in that sense. Now let's, let's see what happens as, they, uh, as we approach winter. Well, this is, this is a picture of one of our hives. <clears throat> and the honeybee colonies are in these hives. We've, as you can see, we've taken off the supers uh, because the honeybees will overwinter as a colony of adults. And because of that, we have to make sure that they have sufficient 
honey and pollen. Uh, and so uh, the success of a hive through the winter depends on them having a large enough colony. They have to have a sufficient colony size in order to survive the winter. What that means then practically is you, if you're going to rob them of the honey, you have to rob before mid-September. And that's because you want to make sure that there's still flowers, golden rods, and those sorts of things that are out there that the bees can use to allow the colony to grow. And during winter, this is what happens is the colony is generally, as I say, on the ground floor and they're surrounding the queen shown here in this little yellow dot. <clears throat> and the colony, if it's good size, it, it will look like this and the honey will be stored in this upper box and on the sides in the lower box. And as winter progresses, that colony will move upward and uh, they will consume the honey. They also get tighter and tighter. Uh, the bees do take turns uh, being on the outer side here where it's colder and then they'll cycle back in. Uh, and so it's everything you would expect of these complex animals that they really know <laughs> how to keep the queen uh, happy and alive through the winter. Then late winter, early spring, she will start to lay some brood. So it's at that point that she will need some, um, uh, some pollen to eat in order to support the brood. And the bees around her, the re remaining colony, then will uh, use the honey and the pollen reserves to begin feeding that brood so that the honeybees can come out and start uh, doing their thing as early as possible. And as early as possible, hmm, what does that mean? That means when the temperature goes up above 55 degrees for several days in a row, the bees will start flying. And it's at that point that their season begins and then the colony begins all over again as it were, to increase in its size and to do what we are normally accustomed to watching them do. But honeybees are very unique. They're not good models of bees in general. Native bees, that's every species of bee that we have in Ohio except the honeybee. Native bees, and in Ohio, we have about 450 species of bees. Most of those are solitary or primitively social. When I say primitively social, I mean they may develop a colony and have a queen to help them develop that colony or to really be in charge of developing that colony. But they will have a, uh, a solitary portion of their annual life cycle. So they have an annual life cycle. Most bees live in the ground. Uh, most species are solitary, and uh, as I say, most of those live in the ground or they'll live in cavities, maybe stems of uh, dried out uh, weeds or dried out uh, twigs. Uh, some are specialists specializing on only one genus and in some cases even only on one species. Uh, while others are generalists and will get nectar and pollen from many different flowers. But specialists, especially specialists in, oops, well, let's see, can I go back? Uh, Jennifer, help me go back. <laughs> uh, there we go. <clears throat> Good job. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, even in the desert, specialists will specialize on only one species. And what that means is that they'll gather pollen only from that species, though they will gather nectar from uh, other flowers in the area. In terms of gathering pollen, many of them are, fat, are better at it than honeybees. I'll talk more about that later. But many of them are better than honeybees. Um, 
as I said, they have an annual life cycle. Uh, most bees do not make excessive amounts of honey. And as I said before, in the United States, only honeybees, uh, Apis mellifera, will make excessive amounts of honey that you could gather. Uh, a lot of people think a bee can only sting you once. Well, that's true. <laughs> that, that is fairly true for honeybees because they have the barbed stinger. And so when they sting you and then fly away, the stinger and the entrails stay with you. <laughs> uh, and that then that bee will die. That's not true of uh, most bees. Although uh, my experience with native bees is yes, they can sting you multiple times, but the only times I've been stung uh, by a native bee is when I was really asking for it. <laughs> and so uh, actually, uh, you're very safe around native bees. Uh, many of them really can't sting you uh, in the sense that they just don't have a stinger that's long enough to penetrate uh, your skin. And uh, of course, only the females can sting. So if you happen to encounter a male bee, uh, you, you could catch it with your hand and hold it around and amaze and amuse your friends. Well, we know that honeybee populations are having a lot of trouble and are in decline. Uh, some estimates are that between a quarter and as many as a half of the uh, colonies are lost per year. That's not true of uh, native bees. Uh, yes, some native Native bee populations are in decline. Uh, some are stable. And actually, some are increasing, even here in Ohio. And it's one of the things that those of us working with the Ohio Bee Survey are trying to determine for each of the species, uh, what is the status of their population? Are they, is the population stable? Or maybe even increasing? Or is it in decline? And, then we'd have to worry about that. <clears throat> so for these reasons, we need to support native bees. We can't, uh, we can no more save the decline in pollination capabilities by having everyone keep honeybees any more than we could save the decline in bird populations by everyone keeping chickens. So, and it's also for many reasons. First of all, honeybees won't pollinate many important crops, even things that we like to have in our gardens, like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, anything in the Solanaceae family. Uh, they can't pollinate because the flower bops them on their nose as they try to go into the flower. So on these, we need to depend on other bees. Also, some native bees pollinate flowers 50 to 100 times faster than honeybees. Honeybees, when they're looking at a flower, they'll kind of hang around and then they'll go in and get the nectar or the pollen. Uh, there are some bees that ting, 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 and even taking pictures of them, uh, trying to take pictures of them can be difficult because they're flying around so fast. Some native bees are not experiencing the same declines and, decrease, uh, and diseases as honeybees. Uh, those who keep honeybees know well, a lot of the problem is with the Varroa mite, which is not only a parasite on the bee, but is also a vector for many of the viruses that cause their uh, lethal diseases. Uh, the Varroa mite is species specific it's, uh, to the honey, to a uh, Apis mellifera. So native bees don't have problems with that particular Varroa mite, though there are other mites that attack uh, some species of native bees. But here's something also to uh, keep in mind that uh, some native bees are specialists. Uh, for example, the alfalfa bee and the uh, blueberry bee, uh, they are specialists on those particular crops. And uh, there are even some uh, genera of crops that depend on those particular bees to uh, pollinate them. So you have to, we have to think in terms of not only the bees being there to pollinate the flowers uh, and the flowers being there to support the bees. 
Uh, so we need to give more attention to these couplets, especially where there are um, bees that are specialists on those flowers or crops. And then finally, although the jury is out, there's not a definite, uh, it's not definite, but one of the things we've had to wonder is, is it possible to have too many honeybee colonies in a given area? And a recent paper that I'll refer to, uh, I'll show you the reference later, uh, that just came out uh, says, yes, it is. And even putting in pollinator strips in uh, uh, fields of crops is insufficient to uh, overcome the, uh, the competitive pressure that honeybees put on some native bees. So this is something that uh, we also have to keep in mind when we think of trying to solve our problems with honeybees, we may be uh, doing ourselves more harm than good by thinking only in terms of uh, having honeybees. So the rest of this talk, I'd like to devote to native bees and they overwinter in different ways. Uh, so we need to understand uh, the species and how they overwinter and especially what we can do to help or what we can stop doing that's hindering them. And uh, yeah, there's a little, uh, there are lessons in both. And I'd like to uh, do this as simply as possible. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the two nectar flows that we have. Uh, you're familiar with them, you've seen them, but you may not be fully aware of them, although you will this spring because you're listening to this lecture. Uh, there's the spring nectar flow, which is those flowers that come out in the spring. And then the, that, those flowers uh, last between, they'll come out sometime and last between uh, April, May, and halfway through June. And then we go into what's called the summer dearth where between the middle of June to towards the end of July, certainly towards the, into the middle of July, there really aren't many floral resources. And after that, then we have a lot of flowers coming out. That's when you have your golden rods and uh, sunflowers and all of those coming out. And the bees know that, you know, they've, they've evolved around this. So uh, you have your spring bees, and you have your summer bees. And uh, I'm going to speak in generalities now. You know, this is biology. So you could always ask, wow, is it that simple? And the answer is always no, it's much more complex than that. But I'm going to speak in generalities tonight. If you want to know specifics, you can ask uh, later. But I'm going to uh, speak in generalities uh, so that it's uh, comprehensible. And uh, the way I'm going to do this is talk about the life cycle of any bee and then ask where in that life cycle uh, do they hibernate? Do they uh, overwinter or go into winter diapause? We all, uh, we all know that, well, the adult female uh, who's been fertilized will lay eggs and she'll either fertilize those eggs when she's laying them or she won't. If she fertilizes them, they turn into females. If she doesn't fertilize the egg, it turns into male. <clears throat> Those eggs will hatch and then go into a larval stage. And the larva looks like a little worm. It starts off looking like a little worm or a little grub. And then this is the uh, pollen ball that uh, she has provided one way or another. Uh, species differ greatly into how they do that and exactly what the larva looks like, but basically that's it. Now the larva will grow and as it grows, it molts its exoskeleton and then enlarges and grows into another form and it will go through five molts. So it grows into a larger grub-like uh, form, a larva. This is the larva in the uh, fifth stage. Uh, so it's gone through four moltings, then 
fifth one it comes out and it's this one. And it's this one, uh, which is called the prepupa, uh, because it's going to make a cocoon. Uh, many of them make a cocoon at this point. Uh, many don't. Uh, they do it in other ways. But they will uh, be in a cavity and then spin a cocoon. And in that cocoon, then they will uh, metamorphose into a pupa. And you can see the pupa looks very different than the larva. And it's really starting to look like a bee. You know, here you have, here you have the head, and then you have the thorax, and you have an abdomen. And you can see here are the wing buds, and here are the legs. So it's really starting to look like a bee. And uh, the pupa then metamorphoses into the adult, and the adult emerges, and that's what we see. So uh, the adult will emerge, and this would be a green sweat bee that's emerged from that. And so the first thing you could ask is, well, is that it? Is, is it that simple? And of course, the answer is, no, it's not that simple. When the pupa uh, metamorphoses into adults, uh, there are adult males and there are adult females. And the adult males have the sperm and they need to fertilize the uh, females. And so they will do that. It's mating. You can see the, the sperm have passed from the males to the females. She's now fertile and the male often isn't even studied as to what happens to the males. They just go off and die. Um, and so that's the generalities of the life cycle of any bee. But where do they overwinter? The egg stage is very fragile. So uh, no bee uh, overwinters in the egg stage. <clears throat> the small larva is kind of fragile, but it gets more and more better and better armor. And by the time it's in the prepupa stage, it's, oh, let's see, how do we do this? By the time it's in the prepupa stage, uh, it's uh, very hardy. Then the prepupa changes into the pupa in a cocoon, perhaps, or not. And the pupa stage is very fragile, but it will metamorphose into the adult. And so these two stages, the prepupa and the adult, which are very hardy, those are the stages in which bees overwinter. Uh, there are, of course, some exceptions, but in general, <clears throat> most, most bees overwinter as this, but many bees, especially the early bees, overwinter as the adult. Well, let's, let's look at that. You have the spring bees, and some of those come out as early as in the next couple of weeks. As soon as you see flowers, start looking for bees. And you might see they'll be small, but start looking for bees. Uh, and these have to come out so early that uh, they would not be able to metamorphose from the prepupa to the adult stage. So they overwinter as adults. <clears throat> and those are the bees in the, those are the spring bees, especially the early ones are the ones that uh, come out uh, having overwintered as adults. Now, later on, <clears throat> you have uh, summer bees, uh, and they will have overwintered in the prepupa stage. And those are bees that come out uh, especially from uh, late July through September, and those will overwinter in the prepupa stage. So I'd like to show you some bees now that uh, overwinter as adults, and you'll say, oh, well, I've heard of those. Those, those are kind of common. I, I, I think I've seen those in my garden. And then I'll show you some where you say, well, those are nice and common too. I think I've seen those in my garden. So uh, that's one of the big take home lessons tonight is yes, you can, you can find these bees and they are there in your garden and you can even make life 
easier for them. And that's part of, I guess that's part of why we're talking about this. <clears throat> One of the best and earliest bees is the common Eastern bumblebee, uh, Bombus impatiens. <clears throat> it's primitively social, and I'll show you what I mean by that, but it means that the, the queen uh, overwinters as an adult, and she overwinters as, as a single bee. So that's the single part of that life cycle. Uh, it is an annual life cycle. The queen emerges early, finds a nest, and she will, uh, once she has found the nest and has started uh, laying brood, she will stay in that nest for the rest of her life and will die there. <clears throat> the native populations of common eastern bumblebees, the best data that we have now is that these populations are increasing in Ohio of this particular species, the Bombus impatiens. Uh, they are ground nesters uh, and they are generalist pollinators. And the best news is if you're interested in having tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, or anything else like uh, uh, aubergine uh, eggplant uh, in your garden, uh, then you really want to help bumblebees get there because they have a special little trick up their sleeves or really a little trick up their wing muscles where they can go into the flower and buzz pollinate. <clears throat> and honeybees can't do that. So honeybees get bopped on the nose and they say, well, we'll just go find another flower. But bumblebees and carpenter bees can both uh, buzz pollinate. One nice thing about uh, common Eastern bumblebee is that it's commercially useful in greenhouses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, bum, uh, honeybees, for example, uh, get disoriented when they get into a greenhouse. But uh, bumblebees, oh, they just love it. So uh, people, the growers who are uh, depending on growing uh, crops in greenhouses are more and more finding ways to use bumblebees in those greenhouses. So let me show you the life cycle of uh, the of this bumblebee. <clears throat> she hibernates. She over overwinters in her hibernation cell. Uh, if you want a fancy word, it's a hiberniculum. But uh, she overwinters in that, and then in mid-March uh, or uh, anywhere between mid-March and uh, end of April, she will emerge from that and then start looking for a place to nest. And she looks for a nesting place. Uh, so you may see these bumblebees kind of hovering about six inches over the ground and it, it's pretty clear she's looking for something. And what she's looking for is the ideal place to nest. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when she finds that, then she lays an egg. The egg hatches, turns into a larva. The larva goes through its five molting stages into a pupa. Uh, and then the pupa metamorphoses into the adult. And it's those daughters of this queen. So here you see the queen in 2021. This, this is this year's queen. And her daughters then are the ones that you see flying out on the flowers. Well, that's April to October, to uh, mid-September or October. Then somewhere in there, <clears throat> she uh, stops fertilizing some of the eggs. So those will be males. And she also lays some eggs and the colony feeds those uh, larvae uh, special food. I mean, they feed her more food. And <clears throat> so then you have males emerging, male bumblebees emerging, and you have virgin queens emerging in say around late September or through mid-October. And of course, the males are out there. The males uh, emerge a little bit earlier than the females, and they are just waiting. And they're waiting to uh, 
mate with the queens. And once they mate, she's then fertile. And the fertilized queen then goes looking for a place to hibernate. And she'll hibernate in holes in the ground. They might be um, mouse holes or something of that sort that she <clears throat> is trying to find. And that's where she will hibernate. So she hibernates as the adult, as a single bee. All the other bees die. All the other uh, bumblebees die. <clears throat> so how can we help, <clears throat> excuse me, how can we help bumblebees overwinter and nest in your yard? Should we prep the ground in special ways or poke holes in it? No, please don't. Just these bees have evolved. They, they know what they're doing. And so we want to keep our yard, or at least parts of our yard, as natural as possible. Uh, they, will, they like to hunt under dried leaves and over bare earth. And especially the, they like it if they're near some kind of a water source. So when she emerges, she can easily find water. <clears throat> so in short, don't try to uh, don't try to do anything uh, exceptional. Just let her be. <clears throat> now I'd like to talk about another bee. This is uh, while the bumblebee is primitively social, the uh, blue orchard bee is truly a solitary bee meaning there aren't any queens in this. They're not gonna form a colony or anything like that. It's a solitary bee. Uh, the female uh, will emerge, uh, mate with males that emerge at the same time. <clears throat> so they have an annual life cycle. Uh, the uh, blue orchard bee is native to Ohio <clears throat> and it uh, nests in tubular cavities. It's a very, very efficient pollinator. This is one I was mentioning that's uh, 50 to 100 times more efficient than a honeybee. What that means is uh, in the time that it takes a honeybee to pollinate one or two flowers, uh, this bee will have pollinated 50 to 100. <clears throat> What's interesting is that they pollinate, uh, they like, they especially like to pollinate uh, families or uh, species in the Rosaceae family. And those would be things like cherries and plums and early apples. And the mason bee, uh, this is a mason bee, and uh, the blue orchard bee will come out uh, very early earlier than honeybees are in full swing. So if you're interested in having cherries or early apples, this is the bee for you. And they are often used commercially to pollinate early flowering crops. <clears throat> the life cycle of a mason bee, of this particular mason bee, is that in the cocoon, so the last larval stage spins a cocoon and then transforms into the pupa and the pupa uh, metamorphoses into the adult and it overwinters as the adult. Then <clears throat> in the spring, uh, when the temperature is just right, uh, the males will emerge first and then the uh, adult females will emerge, but they haven't been uh, fertilized yet. So Hey, this is biology. So the purpose of a male uh, blue orchard bee is to fertilize a female blue orchard bee. And she's now fertile and uh, she will spend a couple of days allowing her ovaries to mature. So she'll go around collecting uh, nectar. Uh, the blue orchard bee male dies off. Uh, he's uh, he was there for one purpose and his purpose is finished. She then starts looking around. And so you'll see here's a uh, mason bee that has just emerged from the cocoon. This is the cocoon and she's just emerged from that. And then she starts flying around looking for something. And you can tell she's looking for something because you, 
she's looking. And this is what she's looking for is uh, tubular cavities uh, that are at least six inches long and five sixteenths of an inch in diameter. And what she does then is she starts making a pollen ball. Uh, she'll visit up to 75 flowers per trip and it takes 25 trips to make one pollen ball. So do the math, it's somewhere around 1800 flowers that she has to pollinate, uh, that she has to visit to make one pollen ball. When she's made that pollen ball, she'll lay a fertilized egg on it and then cap it with uh, some uh, clay. And that's why they're called mason bees. And she'll do that, uh, that's about one day's job to do that. And so the next several days, she will repeat that. Uh, whoever thought up the saying busy as a bee, I think they must have been looking at mason bees uh, because these bees are really busy doing this. Then as she gets closer to the front of the tube, she makes a pollen ball, but now she lays an unfertilized egg on it. So that means then that the uh, these will emerge, the ones closest to the front of the tube will emerge as males. And then shortly after the males have emerged, then the females will emerge. So the male bees are sitting out there waiting for the females to arrive so that they can fertilize them. And here, you, here you, this is uh, someone took this picture. I wasn't, this is the one picture that isn't mine. Um, and here you see the, here's the larva. Uh, and here's the larva, here's the mud coat or the mud separating uh, the chamber. Um, so the life cycle of a mason bee looks like this. Here's the adult fertilized female in 2021. So this will be in just a couple of weeks, this will happen. She will uh, look around for a place to uh, make this nest. She's looking for a tubular cavity, lays an egg on top of a pollen ball. The egg then hatches, goes through five larval molts. And the final one makes a cocoon, uh, changes, turns into the pupa, and the pupa metamorphoses into the adult, and it will stay there. It overwinters in the adult form. And only when conditions are right, and those are largely thermal conditions, when the temperature is just right, that's a fancy scientific way of saying when the temperature is just right, the adult will emerge from that cocoon. So how can we help blue orchard bees overwinter? Well, for one, you can buy the cocoons and uh, there are uh, some farmers and orchard growers <clears throat> who can buy these by the gallon. They're sold by the gallon. Uh, you can also buy tubular homes. Uh, you don't have to buy them by the gallon. There are many places you can buy them uh, a box of 40 or 50 cocoons. Uh, you can also buy tubular homes for them. Uh, there are many sources for that. And then, of course, you can make sure that you have enough plants, native flowers, uh, especially families in the rosaceae, especially flowers in the rosaceae family. And uh, these are, this is the uh, crab apple that uh, Beth and I have in our yard, and it is just filled with bees when it, when it flowers, uh, you wouldn't believe. So uh, it's good to have uh, crops that you know that they will uh, uh, like to pollinate and gather from. But mason bees aren't the only bee that overwinters as an adult. So let's, uh, all of these pictures I took in, in Portage County. So you have uh, the uh, uh, two-spotted uh, bumblebee. Uh, you have the carpenter bee, which also will is a very important pollinator. Uh, you have the this is the large this is the large uh, carpenter bee. This is the small carpenter bee, and it will be around uh, throughout the season. Uh, it's 
does not uh, form nests in wood. Instead, it forms nests in uh, pithy uh, stems. Then you have the uh, green. Uh, this is the green sweat bee, uh, one of the green sweat bees. <clears throat> also, uh, Coletus inequalis uh, comes out very early in the spring. Now, this picture makes it look like that bee is pretty good size, but here's another picture that <laughs> really shows you the size. Uh, I took this picture at the Fred Fuller Park in Kent, and you can see uh, that bee is on a uh, spring beauty. And so when the spring beauties and the bluets are out, this is when you want to look for uh, this bee because uh, they have a relatively short uh, time as adults flying around. Uh, it's maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks. And you can stage that by when you see the uh, uh, spring beauties. Uh, also Andrina. Uh, there are many, many species of Andrina and many of them are early spring bees. Obviously this one is uh, checking out a dandelion. <clears throat> and then you have uh, bumblebees. Uh, this is another kind of uh, bumblebee. This is the all yellow bumblebee, a beautiful, beautiful bee. If you are interested in seeing the beauty in nature, I encourage you to look, look at bumblebees. But I'd like to switch gears now and talk about bees that <clears throat> overwinter in the pupip uh, in the pupipal pre-pupal form. <laughs> And so I'm going to show a series of diagrams. And the dotted line here is the surface of the ground. So everything below this is in the ground, and everything above this is up in the air. And they're overwintering, so this is winter, and they're in the pre-pupa stage in the ground. Uh, when as the ground warms, uh, and here in our area, this would be largely when the temperature is just right then they will change and go into a pupal stage. The pupa uh, readily transforms into an adult and the adults emerge. And that's when we see them flying around. And I've kind of overdrawn the size of this box because they may be around for only a couple of weeks. I've shown them here for a couple of months, but they may be around for only a couple of weeks. Uh, the adults then look for uh, nests. Usually they form nests in the ground, uh, lay eggs there. The eggs hatch and go to a larval stage and the larvae uh, go through the four molts. The fifth molt is the pre-pupa and that's how it will stay. It will stay there as the pre-pupa stage through winter. And so if we looked at this on an annual cycle, we would see, well, here's 2021, but these went into the ground a long time ago. So they went in the ground maybe last September and stayed there. And these now are going in the ground in August or September, and they will not emerge until next uh, June or July. Not only that, but some bees uh, hedge their bets. You know, what if they were to emerge and there weren't the flowers there? What if this was an off year uh, or something like that? They hedge their bets by having only some of them emerge. Uh, the others staying in the pre-pupa stage for another year, maybe for another two years, and then emerge only after they've been in the ground for two or three years when the conditions are just right. Uh, this is especially true of bees, of uh, desert bees. Uh, their cues are more likely to be uh, the moisture of the ground because the flowers that they will uh, come out and pollinate and depend upon also emerge uh, with uh, rainfall as a function of proper amounts of rainfall. So especially some desert species will uh, over, over winter as it were uh, for several years in this uh, pre-pupal stage. So let's look at some Portage County bees that overwinter in that pre-pupal stage. Well, this is a 
leaf cutter B, if uh, you see uh, little holes in your uh, rose flower, in your rose uh, leaves, it's probably this, this bee or some of its relatives that are using those cut leaves to line their nests. Then uh, there's also Melisodes. These are longhorn bees. Um, there are many species of Melisodes. Uh, this is the two-spotted bee. And you can see this once you're looking, once you know what you're looking for, you can easily see the two spots there at the bottom of their uh, uh, abdomen. Here's another Melisodes. This is obviously on, it's a specialist on ironweed. Uh, this is the uh, dark black uh, sweat bee. So it's a dark black sweat bee. Uh, this one uh, is really kind of out all summer. Uh, clearly here he's on a, or she is on a, uh, on an ester. And there are uh, many species of helictus that will specialize on uh, uh, asters. Andrina, now remember I said there are a lot of species of Andrina. This is a late season Andrina and uh, this species overwinters in the pre-pupal stage. And then there's Hylaeus, sometimes called the clown-faced uh, bee and all of that. So what can we do to help bees overwinter? Well, just as we try to provide them habitat uh, by planting a lot of flowers, we want to make sure that we provide habitat so that they can overwinter, since most of those bees will not fly too far from where they have overwintered. Uh, to do that, leave spots of open soil. Uh, don't rototill your garden. Leave some spots untilled. In our garden, we have strips of untilled and then tilled areas for just this purpose. Uh, also, don't clean up your standing dead weeds. Uh, this, these are remnants of uh, ironweed and similar weeds that cut back to maybe 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches, and leave them there so that the bees can overwinter in these stems. Uh, uh, as some bees are stem nesters. And uh, instead of putting mulch on garden beds, instead leave, uh, let some leaves on the ground. The bees have evolved to, they know just how to do this and they don't want us to come and mess things up for them. <laughs> so it sounds a little bit complex, but basically all I'm saying is let's leave our gardens as natural as possible, at least in some areas to support uh, bee overwintering habitat. Well, won't that look kind of scruffy? Uh, I suppose it could, but here's what I'm doing. Instead of having flowers border my lawn, see all of this was lawn, I'm now having my lawn border my flowers. So this is now going to be a whole flower bed here. Uh, and then the lawn. Uh, lawn is uh, very useful for one thing, which is that walking on. And uh, so here's here are paths of lawn that I've put. And then the rest of this in here and in here and over in here, all of that will be uh, floral beds. So it's something to think about. And sometime we could uh, talk more about this. This is uh, also in the books by uh, uh, Doug Ptolemy, uh, such as The Living Landscape, wonderful books. Uh, and here are some references. Uh, if you're interested in honeybee biology and beekeeping, it's all in this book. Uh, if it's not in this book, you probably don't need to know it. Uh, this is a very comprehensive book for honeybees. Now, if you're interested in native bees, this is by far the best book. It's beautifully done and uh, beautifully written, uh, and it's easy to understand. So if you're interested in beginning to know about the bees in your backyard, this is the one. It's by uh, Joe Wilson, oops, Joe Wilson and uh, Olivia Carroll, and it's a fairly recent book. 
I also referred to this book by uh, Brian Danforth and others. Very recent book, very technical book. I don't recommend this for beginners, but if you say, hey, I'm not a beginner, I want to read the really technical stuff and see all of the different things that you didn't talk about. Well, it's all in this book. Once again, if it's not in this book, it probably isn't known because it's a very comprehensive text. Uh, the article I referred to, Honey Bee Hives Decreased Bee Abundance, Species Richness, and Fruit Count on Farms, Regardless of Wildflower Strips, just came out a couple of months ago and uh, gives us some cause for concern. And then finally, I want to recognize the personal communications I've had with uh, Joe Wilson of the biology department at the Utah State University. Uh, Joe has been a real winner and a big help to me. And finally, I'd like to leave us all with this thought as soon spring will be here. And so let's start looking for bees. <laughs>